Hey, deserving listeners, 90 Day Fiance, Mary and Brandon. Let's watch. Okay, so he's on his air flight, air flight, flight to the Philippines to see her for the first time. He says, I finally got Wi-Fi. How are you doing? And her first question is, let me see who's next to you. And then he says, they have me sitting next to a girl. Mary, there's nothing I can do about it. What could he possibly do about that? And what, anyway. And then she says, great. So let's see where this goes. As I'm finally in the air, there's a girl next to me and I'm showing Mary and she's getting those insecurities and thoughts. Now, I'm sure I've said this before with this couple. I know I've said it with others that there's nothing wrong with having attachment reactivity, with having preoccupied attachment, with having jealousy, with experiencing feelings of worry, of attachment loss, maybe even paranoia, unreasonable, intrusive, irrational thoughts of your partner cheating on you. That happens. There's nothing wrong with that. It, it, it has nothing to do with you and everything to do with what happened to you in the past. People don't choose to have those intrusive thoughts. Nothing wrong with that. She is clearly experiencing those thoughts. Nothing wrong with that, as I said. <laughs> five times. However, there is something wrong with transmuting those feelings into rage, control, accusation, hostility, and abuse. She could say, oh my God, I'm so triggered right now that you're standing next to someone. I'm so sorry. It's not your fault. I know nothing's going to happen, but there's a part of me that is worried. Can you please reassure me? Or even... Could you please move to another seat? Is that possible? I know that's really ridiculous and just so inconvenient, but I'm so triggered. You could do that. Your partner might say, oh, I can't really do that. I'm, I can't. It's, uh, I'm sorry. But it's a totally different approach. Jealousy is your problem. It's not your partner's problem. And jealousy, well, under most circumstances, is your problem, not your partner's problem. It could be your partner's problem if they cheated on you and now you're jealous. Um, but even then, it's probably still the feelings that you're having aren't probably rational in the moment, unless they are. It's complicated, as you know. But in this situation, her feelings are irrational, as is most feelings when people are jealous. It doesn't mean that it's wrong. It doesn't mean that it's that you need to get rid of the feelings. That's the wrong approach. It's just ask for help in the same way that if you are worried that you're going to lose your partner because they don't love you anymore, even though there's no evidence that they don't, no real evidence that they don't love you anymore, you don't say, you never tell me you love me. No, you go to them and say, I am having a, a moment where I'm worried that you don't love me, not that you've done anything, but I'm having that paranoia and I don't want to lose you and I love you. Can you reassure me that you love me? It's way more inviting to the other person. When you buy plane tickets and you're picking your seat, it's not like you can see what... Wow. I, I mean, every time this happens, it's astonishing, but it is consistent with what we've seen before. Now, she reports that he is jealous and controlling as well, which we've only heard reports of, as far as I know. But at the very least, we know Mary has a massive problem. <laughs> Just a massive problem. What gender a person is sitting next to you, like, I can't control that. And I know that no one can seduce me and make me change my mind about Mary. I've been wanting to go to the Philippines for over two years now. I'm finally... So she's saying, you're going to talk. I'm not going to talk to her. Of course you're going to talk. No, I'm not going to talk to her. What if he did talk to her? Who cares? <laughs> He is flying across the globe to be with her with the intent on pot potentially getting engaged. They, he's been with Mary for two years. And what, it, what are you, you know, the, 
it's normal to have that intrusive thought and to have a, a rash, but there should be some voice in her head saying, okay, well, let's really look at the evidence here. <laughs> let's really, let's really think about, even if he did talk to her, what is going to happen? What could possibly happen? And it's all because one, her abandonment, she was abandoned by her parents when she was eight months old, which is old enough to have a massive attachment disruption and a schema basically of assuming that everyone is going to abandon her. That's, that's not her fault, but what do you do with it? You have a rational mind somewhere in there that can think it through a little bit. And maybe the, you have times of being triggered, and then later times you're like, oh, I was triggered earlier. We're not hearing that she does that, though. We're hearing just round the clock, assuming that all of her, her, all of her irrational, intrusive thoughts are rational and justifications for bothering him. I mean, just imagine being in his shoes in this moment, that you're flying out to see her, and it's three flights, and it's probably a good... 20 hours of travel probably more when you consider taxi cabs and all this so it could be like 30 hours of travel it's a pain in the ass it's very energy draining and annoying and cramped he's never been outside the country so he probably hasn't flown that often but even if he has you know it's it's a lot of effort he's leaving everything behind his family all of his possessions everything he knows and you're getting these texts of accusation and hostility and anger and control. And it's just because when the airline was assigning seats or you chose a seat, someone else chose a seat, it could be literally a couple that's sitting next to him. And just because of that, the entire day is ruined. I mean, just imagine how frustrating that would be. Only on my way, there's nothing that's gonna change that but she's automatically thinking, oh, he's gonna flirt. He's some type of pig. Wow, wow. So she's like, he's saying, I, I'm not gonna talk to her. I don't know what to say. And she's like, yes, you will. And then he just stops replying because he's thinking, I don't know what else to say. He can't even reply because, so that, that could even be part of her abusive strategy, which is, I'm going to keep control over him through this text conflict such that he doesn't have time to cheat on me or leave me or have someone else influence him away from me. Because Mary is so insecure. I'm kind of like scatterbrained right now. I was sitting next to a girl and Mary was overthinking so I got switched to an empty seat. He got switched. What does that mean? Does that be? He must admit he asked because there's no way that someone would have known that. So he asked to be switched to another seat. Okay, that could have been asked. She could have asked that, Mary. She could have, like I role played earlier. She could have just been like, I know this is so stupid. It is my issue. I've been abandoned by my parents. I've been cheated on by my ex several times. And I'm just so worried. I don't want to lose you. It's so dumb, but could you please ask for another seat? And then he says, okay. And then he does, and we're good. So, And then she can relax while also knowing how to communicate. He can know that it's it's not his fault. He's not being blamed. You know, It'd be like if I was, if I broke my leg, for example, and I needed my wife to get me something. I don't say like, give me that thing, or you never get me that thing. I, I would say, oh, I'm so sorry, can you grab me that thing? It's unreasonable that I'm asking you to do that, but you know, my leg's broken. It, it, it's a, just say that, just say that. But because we live in a society, and I'm guessing there's a lot of societies around the world that shame emotion and trauma and don't talk about it enough, no one even knows they have a broken leg. They're just walking around with a broken leg and thinking that that's just the way life is. and every, that the world needs to revolve around their broken leg. Yeah. I feel like I can't win. I don't. L-I-S-R. Lisser? Lisser? Is that young people talk for something? Lisser meaning. Oh, liar? 
Google says, do you mean liar? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, because I guess S is next to A. So she says, liar. Yikes. <laughs> My goodness. Wow. I mean, we've seen jealousy and controlling behavior on this show, right? There was the Jasmine and Gino thing. And I thought that, we all thought that was astounding. This is on a whole other level. On a level that I would think the producers would consider not even having this couple because it's so uh, extreme and not okay. But somehow it's okay because it's a woman. I mean, imagine if a man was doing this to a woman. Surely they would not let that on the show, right? But somehow because it's a woman doing it, it's like, well, it's it's funny or it's this weird quirk that she has. No, it's abusive. It's controlling. Just because he's a man does not mean he cannot be victimized. Now, I should pause and say that y'all have watched the whole season, I'm guessing, and there's a possibility that he is a much bigger jerk face than she is. I don't know. But at the very least, and please always remember that. Sometimes I'll get entire groups of hatred in the comment section. And when I read the comments, I'm so confused because I am wondering where it's all coming from. And then I watch the rest of the series or even later in that episode. And I'm like, oh, well, that's... But I hadn't seen that yet. So how could I incorporate that into the vibe? You know, like if he is a 90% jerk face in this relationship, then the demeanor that I would have when I talk about her behavior would incorporate that. I would say, well, that's not okay, but we understand like really the problem is him, you know, that kind of talk. And I do that. And when I don't incorporate that, but people want me to incorporate that because they can't mentalize because they don't know that I haven't watched it yet or don't care to think about that, then they're like, but he's the jerk face, you know, how do you possibly, you know, and it's just, it's just frustrating <laughs> sometimes. Now, that's not to say that if anyone criticizes me, that's somehow some indictment on the person as if they have a hard time with mentalization or they're short-sighted or simple-minded or something. I'm not saying that. <laughs> I'm just saying that sometimes, I, you know, occasionally that happens. Rarely, honestly, very rarely, but it does kind of bug me. And I would hope that everyone, and I feel like most people can understand that I can only react to what I, I think I've been traumatized by Colt and Larissa. That's really what it comes down to. This was three years ago-ish, and I watched that full first season of Colt and Larissa, which was apparently edited in a way seemingly that was pro-Colt and anti-Larissa, and I was reacting to what I saw, which was Larissa being a jerk face a lot and Colt, uh, you know, having some issues but not a lot. And then in the subsequent seasons, Colt was a jerk face to Larissa, to his other girlfriend. He was a jerk face to his mom, DDD. And uh, uh, but the whole time I'm watching Colt and Larissa that first season, uh, uh, you know, this is all the seasons were out and everyone had seen him, and I was coming in, you know, late. And everyone was just like, how do you possibly, Larissa is awesome and Colt is a complete ass. And a lot of people were commenting, and I didn't understand what was happening. A lot of people were commenting saying like, hey, uh, commenter, understand that Kirk has not seen the next season. <laughs> so give it time. Good things come to those who wait. And it was a real hubbub, which not only hurt my feelings, but also worried me because the comment section had conflict, which... You know, I don't want people to have bad blood between themselves. You know, it's a reality TV show. We shouldn't be that. Uh, we shouldn't destroy the world based on our opinions about a reality TV show. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. So I don't know about you, but throughout my day, I have two opposing forces in my mind between what I want to do, like playing a video game or playing with my dogs, and what I should do, like... Uh, exercise more or eat more fiber or something. As a therapist, I talk with a lot of clients about this inner conflict. Most people think it's all about willpower, even though research demonstrates that willpower doesn't really work. There are a lot of evidence-based techniques that actually work that people don't usually consider, like using behavioral shaping techniques or healing from our relational traumas that keep us stuck internally. 
Well, one option worth exploring is BetterHelp. If you're thinking of starting therapy, it's worth giving a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient and suited to your schedule. And also, you can switch therapists at any time at no additional charge. So, make your brain your friend with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash Kirk today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Kirk. All right, just landed. Now that's flight one of three down. Yeah, wow, just wow. And we are used to seeing this from men, right? That if, uh, well, like with Ed and Liz, that Liz, exactly this happened. Liz, apparently, from what I understand, was at work and there's a guy and the guy needed a ride home. It was like a, a half hour drive or something. And Liz asked Ed, is it okay if I drive this guy home? Ed said, okay. Liz drives him home. And then on the way back or later on, they're on the phone and Ed is berating her and uh, you know, putting her down and attacking her and being hostile and demeaning to her and argumentative and unrelenting in this very uh, calm manner, the way that Ed does. You know, it'd be one thing if Ed was like, Oh my God, I'm just completely freaking out. You're just such, I don't understand why you did that. But with certain people, when given their defensive structure and their personality, when on the inside, they're just like, ah, on the outside, they are calm and they are calculating and they are, they're not a psychopath. They're just defended regarding showing their emotions or even noticing their emotions you know on the inside they could just be like but on the outside they just they even sometimes people will look even more calm when that happens because they needed to be that way that when they were growing up and so we saw that with ed and liz is crying and she's begging and saying but you said it was okay and nothing happened and you know how come you're saying those things to me and and he's just berating and putting her down and saying all these things and things like this. Things like, well, you know, you might should, I, 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 I don't know if it was exactly this, but it was something along these lines. And I wouldn't be surprised if he did. And it's certainly in that profile of like, you know, did you have sex with him? Was it better? You slut. You're always wanting to have sex with him. You should just have go have sex with him. Go fine. You know, you want to drive him home? Go have sex with him. Go have sex with your, you know, it's a real common jealous, abusive partner thing to say, and she is saying those things. She's upset, but no one's sitting next to me, so. Okay, so we saw a text where she is saying, of course there's gonna be another girl. I mean, my goodness. And then, of course, we saw the scene where she turns off her Wi-Fi so that she can have an excuse not to be on video call with him. And then she goes and hangs out with her three or four friends who are guys. And they talk about penises and sex and stuff. <laughs> like, which is fine, but double standard much? We're just so used to overthinking and fighting over the phone that it's just become normal for us. But I can only tolerate it up to a certain point. So another conversation. So F you and your girls there. So it seems like that's one of the things that she says. F you and F the old girls. And he's saying, I didn't do anything. And maybe he did. Did he do anything? Don't know like what to say, what to do. It makes me very worried about whether or not I'm making the right choice going to the Philippines and committing my whole life there. And I should also say that there's a chance that a, a lot of you knowing things in the future, because I'm just going to take a guess and say that she's not the only jerk face in this relationship. I don't know. But even if there are, like, say he did cheat on her and she has reasons to worry about him cheating on her in the future, that still doesn't justify what, just because someone cheats on you doesn't mean you have the right to control and abuse them. <laughs> and be unreasonably jealous and, can, and accusatory and hostile. 
it's not how the world works just because someone cheats on you maybe in the, for a short period of time there's some reasonable reactivity and anger that will happen from the victim but not as time moves forward it's not like a policy you can enact that well my partner cheats on, cheated on me five years ago and that's why I have them chained to the bed with a blindfold on because a, a woman might walk by the window and I just can't have him looking at, at women. Um, you know, that's an exaggeration, but, you know, it's in that direction. So, uh, I, I mean, I, I guess I'll hold out for the possibility that I'll have, I, I can't see this being acceptable. He might be a jerk face too, but this is definitely jerk face. Okay, they're showing this picture in the background. I don't know what that means. It looked like they were doing a flashback series of texts. So are we looking at a flashback series of texts or are we looking at current texts? Is she saying you don't belong here as he's almost there on the plane or was this a previous conversation? What's happening? The way it's edited, it's all, it, it sounds like that's what is happening right then as he is getting on his second flight, which is to Manila, I believe. And if I were to take a guess, I would say that she is having an increase in attachment, preoccupation, and terror because the reality of the relationship is coming into focus because he's almost there. It's, it, it could be, and I've hypothesized this before about a lot of these folks, is that when people have attachment disruptions and abandonment and abuse and chaos and or chaos, they have a lot of natural worries about getting close to people, but they desperately want to be close to people. In fact, they need to be closer to people they need to be close to people more than other people do because they've never had that kind of security. So they're desperate to be close, but they're very terrified to be close. This is a description of general in, you know, insecure attachment, whether it's you know dismissive, avoidance, or preoccupied, or, or disorganized, fearful. But it's particularly indicative of disorganized, fearful. And for these people, and I wouldn't be surprised, the way she acts she is potentially on the disorganized spectrum somewhere. Disorganized attachment. Let's do my deep dives on that if you want more information. Uh, I have a whole deep dive on attachment that maybe a lot of you have even listened to. Um, I am told by people that it is perhaps the best thing that I've ever done in my life, <laughs> making that deep dive, which I will take because I, you know, if it was some weird random episode that people held up as this pinnacle of my career, I'd be like, huh? I mean, I'd take it, but I'd be confused. But this one I believe in and, am, you know, if, if on my, epi if in the epitaph it says, you know, Kirk Honda died, he made a deep dive about attachment theory, and that's all they said, I I'd be happy with that. <laughs> so when... Uh, uh, people have those kinds of reactivities to attachment worries, they will not only be very hypervigilant about, oh my God, I'm about to lose some. I'm about, they're about to, I'm a, they're going to leave me. They're going to leave me. They're going to leave me. This is dangerous. It's dangerous. I'm close to someone. But as the person even gets closer, then the terror goes up even further because for those individuals with complex trauma, they were stuck in the, so let me just talk about disorganized attachment for a second, very briefly, because I've been yammering too much with these two. There's just a lot of things to talk about, but when you have a parent that's being abusive, children, they have an, they have an instinct that uh, has two prongs to it. They have an instinct to run away from danger, run away from the monster, the stranger, the, the dog, the loud noise, you know, they, You've, if you've been around kids or you have your own kids, you've seen that, right? A dog a, oh, or a stranger, oh, and, and they run toward their attachment figure, their caregiver. And they also, so, so they have, so that's the two-pronged instinct, run away from danger, run toward caregiver. Well, what if the caregiver is the danger? What does the child do? The child has an instinct to run toward 
the mom who is being abusive. That instinct is very strong. If you've ever seen a child, that instinct is, you know, children don't think, hmm, who should I run to? Maybe mom, what should I do? Let me make a list. Mom, that random person over there, older brother, hmm, let's go with mom. No, it's, a, it's just instinct. There's no thought, it's mom, you know? And so they have that instinct and they're stuck in this instinct of, but I need to run away from the danger. The monster is also mom, so I need to go that direction, but I want to go this direction. I also want to go that direction, and I'm desperate. And it's not just the thought. It's a one of the deepest instinct, instinctual motivations that a, 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 an organism can have. It is all-encompassing, right? It's not like, like right now I have... A, a slight motivation to stand up and stretch because I've been sitting in this chair for a long time, um, which I do occasionally. But I I have a, a slight need for that or a, a little bit of a motivation to do that. But it's not overwhelming, right? Because I it's not that bad and I know I'll eventually get there. And I have other things I'd rather do, which is Yammer into this, into this uh, video recorder. Camera is a better name for it. <laughs> and uh, 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 whereas the instinct to run away from danger and toward your caregiver, it is all encompassing. There's there's no room for any other thought, feeling, or motivation. It's physical, uh, which is why children are so desperate in those situations. Because, of course, we evolved to be that way because of the benefits for survival when you are two years old and some you know a snake or a tiger or whatever comes out of the woods and without thinking the child just runs to their parents then that obviously leads to greater likelihood of survival and more likelihood to propagate your genes which means that we were selected for that instinct uh, evolutionarily wise so it's very strong and when she had all those disruptions and who knows even what happened pre eight months it's not like we know necessarily that everything was hunky-dory before she was eight months old and was abandoned by her parents but she is experiencing now the deep deep need to have closeness with someone him and or, or you know rewinding the clock she doesn't know him yet she really wants to be with someone and maybe she might have even subconsciously chose someone before him who is likely to be a cheater. I don't know. I don't want to, it's just not her fault, but it could be a factor in her pattern. But she goes online and cognitively what she said was, I like Bieber and, and Harry Potter, so I wanted to be with American. And like I said before, both those fellas are not American. <laughs> And she's like, I, I, I want to be with America. So she goes on, uh, uh, you know, whatever, and finds him. And then she in consciously is thinking, well, I don't like guys in my town because they treat women like shit or whatever, whatever she was saying. And I think Americans are nicer, so I'm going to date. But really what's happening for her is that she can get some of her needs met of attachment and connection and loyalty and uh, entertainment and romance but there's less at stake because he's not here so i can date with some distance but there's, a, there's another part of her that desperately wants him completely and all that security which most people want particularly people who have been through the experiences she has so then she has this weird convoluted way of managing that by controlling him. Then as he is getting physically closer, as he's flying there, her anxiety starts to go through the roof because, and I don't know if this happened to her, but as mom, who is also abusive in this metaphor, mom, it, I, I want mom, but mom's getting closer. <gasps> what do I do? I'm desperate. I'm so happy she's coming closer, but I, but it, but mom's also the, the the boogeyman mom is the monster so uh, what do i do uh, jealousy jealousy freak out freak out don't don't come get away you're a jerk face it's just easier if i just wipe the slate clean you know that and i'll be motivated to wipe the slate clean if i have delusions of being mistreated and being cheated on 
Okay, well, that does it for that episode. Everyone, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.